This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 769 of Horse Tip Daily. A different horse tip, a different equine topic, a different equestrian expert every day. Horse Tip Daily brings the world of equine knowledge to you one day at a time. Today's tip is brought to you by EquestrianCollections.com. Greetings, horse people. Coach Jen here, and thanks for tuning in to Horse Tip Daily. Today's tip is an excerpt from the Horse.com's weekly horse health report on the Horses in the Morning show. The Hit'em crew is joined by the Horse.com digital editor, Michelle Anderson, and Dr. Jones for a timely chat about EHV. And we'll get to that right after this message from Equestrian Collections. Hi, Glenn here from the Horse Radio Network, and I am with Debbie from Equestrian Collections with Equestrian Collections Product of the Week. This week, I'm talking about the Composite Colored Premium Stirrup Irons. These things jumped out at me when we first got them because of all the colors that they come in. They're a composite stirrup, and that's all the new rage in stirrups right now because they are very, very light. I think the eventers would particularly like this stirrup because it is so light and because of all the colors. It comes in two sizes, four inch and four and three quarters. And the colors are like royal blue, bright green, lime green, yellow, orange, pink, light blue, all those kind of colors um, that you can match your outfits, or if you're an inventor, you can match your, uh, your, the outfit that you wear when you compete. We also sell uh, the stirrup, fill- the fillings on the bottom of the stirrup separately so that you don't always have to have the same color. I have a pair of these, and what I liked about them besides the color was the fact that they were very, very light. Um, you felt like um, you, it, just, it just felt really good. You can run the stirrups up, and you're not going to mess up your your saddle at all with those. They're just really nice composite stirrups in very bright colors. I think they're a real fun uh, item to get and a real fun gift to give. And uh, for for the price under thirty bucks, you can't beat that. You could have uh, one of every color. Well, exactly. Um, my colors are uh, royal blue for one horse and orange for the other, so I intend to get the orange ones and the blue ones. <laughs> there you go. Well, you can find them at equestriancollections.com. Just search for colored stirrups and they'll come up. Glenn, that, if, yeah? if I may, just real quick. Dr. Jones, good morning. How big of a fan of Pitbull the Rap Star are you? I don't know many rap stars, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so she's just as huge a fan as we are. Congratulations. You can, too, go see him at the Preak Mistakes in the infield sometime during the day. The tickets are only $40. <laughs> well, what do you 40 get for $40? Right? <laughs> That's your well, whole it, infield pass, too. <laughs> it's time for the Horse.com Weekly Horse Health we're going to get a little bit serious here because everybody's yeah. been seeing the articles and, and what's going on here in Florida and now for other parts of the country. We're going to talk mm-hmm. about EHV. So take it away, Michelle. Yeah. Um, you know, unfortunately, we're seeing cases of equine herpes virus, um, the neurologic form popping up. Um, you guys have talked about the Florida cases. Uh, on Friday, our news editor was out, so I was helping run news. Um, and so I got to chase that story. Um, lots of waiting for official information. Dr. Jones and I talked on Friday because she's down there in Florida. Uh, but that horse, the last report is that the horse is stable. Um, there's a bunch of farms that are quarantined currently uh, to help prevent the spread because of horses that were uh, po- potentially exposed to this horse. But it, it looks like things down in Florida are under control. There were some horses also late last week uh, exposed up in New Jersey, and there were two farms that were quarantined because of exposure uh, up there. And then this morning we have uh, the new news that two horses have been euthanized in Utah um, after being confirmed with EHV-1, oh, wow. uh, the neurologic form. There's three horses that are showing clinical signs but haven't yet been confirmed. Those horses... Uh, 
all seem to have a relationship to the Cache County Fairgrounds in Utah, uh, horses being ridden or exercised there during the past week. Uh, so that they've closed down that facility, uh, trying to get this under control and see who else has potentially been exposed. So anytime horses are being euthanized, it's, it's a scary thing for us. Um, so we have Dr. Jones here to tell us a little bit about this disease, a refresher. I think it's good to remember what it is and then also how to protect our horses. So good morning, Dr. Jones. Good morning. I'm so sorry to have to have this discussion, but as we move horses around more readily with trailers and airplanes and such, this becomes a bit more of a disease we need to be cognizant of because uh, the horse-to-horse -horse communication, the contamination of going nose-to-nose -nose in trailers and, you know, airplanes even, stuff like that. So we're going to encounter, encounter this more than we have in the past because horses are moving around a bit more. It's easier yeah. to move them. Yeah. So let's start out. Can you explain to us a little bit about what equine herpes virus is? Um, let me just try to make it as simple as possible. Herpes virus is also called the, the rhino um, vi virus that people are uh, vaccinating for, so you don't think it's a completely different uh, bug than what we actually help your horses with with vaccines. And that herpes can come in three forms, an abortive form, which is why we do the shots when the mare is pregnant, the respiratory form, which is the one we give your horse to keep them from getting snotty noses at the shows, and then the neurologic form, which we have no vaccine for. And so, you know, we've always well, <laughs> vaccinated our, especially our young horses for a rhino to protect them um, from the snotty nose. And that, for me, I was always like, oh yeah, okay, my horse has a rhino vaccine, but what about this neurologic strain? How do we protect our horses from, from that? Well, that's the difficulty, is there's actually um, two strains within that. There's a wild strain and a mutant strain. So if you can think about all the the, if anybody's familiar with making vaccines, it's very hard to, to track a DNA virus and to create a vaccine that's going to take care of both of those strains. So once you make a vaccine for one, the other one might become more you know, rampant and vice versa. So if they're, they're, they're doing their best they can and trying to um, isolate how to best protect for this, this uh, virus, but in the meantime, it's really just uh, doing good biosecurity of your own, meaning, meaning don't share water troughs, don't go nose to nose with strange horses you don't know. Um, if you're stalled and you're at a show and you don't have a, you know, a preference of who's going to be stalled next to you, maybe put your tech trunk next or your tech room, feed room next to the next population of horses next to you, and then that way you're at least one stall away from them. Uh, and there's just different things you can do, and especially when you're waiting outside the arena for your jump class or whatever class it is, Western riding class, don't stand there with other horses in your class that you don't know what their vaccine history is and let your horses touch noses. The other thing, too, is people can transfer it back and forth. They can get the nasal discharge on their hands. They can get it on another bucket and then place a bucket in your stall that was in another horse's stall. So uh, those kind of things are, are important. Simple, very simple thing. We all are guilty of it dipping your hose all the way down into the bucket, filling the bucket up, pulling it out on a used bucket, putting it in the next bucket is a great way to transfer nasal discharge bugs from one bucket to the next. Yeah, so, and how many shows have you been at where you have one hose that is feeding, you know, two tenths of horses and everyone's stretching mm -hmm. it down the aisle way. So, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, there's just so many different ways to do it besides just a horse coughing or sneezing. And, again, we've had this discussion. Their, their nasal passage snot can travel and cough can travel up to 35 feet. So, you know, you've got them going right across the aisleway in a center stall barn or next door to your stall. You know, you've got a 12-by-12 12 12 stall. You're, you're coughing or snorting right to the horse next to you. Even if you've got a little bit of shavings up the horse's nose and they just go to blow it out, they could send out that virus even though they're not showing clinical signs yet. So with those clinical signs, in the neurologic form, what are we seeing? What does that mean when we say neurologic form? Well, usually they all come with a fever, so it's kind of the easiest thing to pick up on is a horse won't eat, they're lethargic, that kind of thing, check the temp. And I tell my clients time and time again, your best protection in your first aid kit is a thermometer. Always, always, always carry a thermometer. First time your horse doesn't eat, you might think it's colic, but if you take their temperature at the same time, which doesn't take very long to check, you might catch a fever, and that's just as important as a colic situation. 
so taking temps, which is what they're requiring now in the quarantine barns, and any of the horses that were familiar with this horse, they're all doing the temp taking now. So now I have a question on that, Dr. Jones. Yeah. Is it is it a high fever? Is it a low grade fever? What are you looking for? It can start as low as 101.5 on a cold night, you know, or a cold morning. So it doesn't have to be 100 and 405. So if you've got 102 okay. temp on a horse, I call that a fever, and, and let's let's start looking into it. Okay. Um, so once the horses have the neurologic form, what's the likelihood that they're going to need to be euthanized? Can they survive this? They can survive it. Like the one in Florida here is recovering very well. They feel that this one is the mutant strain, not the wild strain. The wild strain seems to cause more of the deaths um, in the horses because it seems to be a bit more uh, stronger and more rampant in the, in the um, spinal uh, area where they're causing um, brain damage and spinal damage to the horse's uh, neurologic system. But uh, you really have to just focus on anything neurologic is decreasing pressure in the spinal cord in the brain and any inflammatories that cross into the blood-brain barrier, which is steroid, dexamethasone, um, any kind of uh, a diuretic to pull the fluid out of that area to kind of take the pressure off because it increases fluid and causes pressure on that area. Um, increasing blood flow so they may go on fluids because they're starting to get dehydrated because they're not drinking, they're febrile, and you want to make sure that things are circulating well to remove the virus. Uh, so it's basically just doing your stabilization of the animal, um, making sure that all their vitals are working just well. Okay. Um, and so for everyone listening who may be in these areas where we've seen some neurologic EHV1, what would be your top recommendations to them? Do they need to stay home and, and hole up, or can they safely travel with their horses? Well, you know, just know who you're traveling with. So if you're going to a commercial hauler, you take a higher risk. Um, and if you're going by yourselves with your, with your farm, just stay with your farm. You know, you can tie to the side of your trailer. You can get a, a, a barn that's solely for your farm. And it's, of course, these places that have these horses have quarantine requirements. And within those quarantined areas, only certain people are allowed in there. And those people stay in there. And as they leave, they have to go through dip buckets change of clothes so that they aren't transferring what's in that quarantine area outside. And that's very well uh, taken care of by each state health department. And uh, they, they control that very, very well. Here in Florida, they have tracked down how many horses came in communication with this first horse. They're following those. We have up to nine farms that are quarantined right now um, in the state of Florida. A lot of them surrounding hits the showgrounds, but some are as far away as there's one here in Orlando, uh, one in Tampa area. Uh, one down in Wellington. So they are tracking these, these animals, and then they're going to quarantine a 30-foot, you know, basically radius around those animals and uh, test them for fever every day and follow them along to make sure that this does not become as um, widespread as it can be. How long will they test them for? Is the incubation period, uh, it can be up to like a week, right? Yeah, it can be as short as a week, but usually it's a 21-day, and that's what quarantine oh, really? is, is okay. 21 days. You can even see them four to five weeks out uh, come up with the disease and, and incubate oh, wow. it up to four to five weeks out. But 21 days is your usual standard. Each state's different. Here in Florida, it's 21 days. Uh, at the end of 21 days, they have to test them with a nasal swab and blood, um, blood draw. Now, think about it. Okay, 21 days, they're not free to go yet. They have to make sure that those test results come back. So really, those test results take about 48 hours to run at the state accredited labs. And so you're really in jail, per se, for 23 days. You're quarantined for about 23 days until you get the release of the, the okay to go. I have to say that the one thing, because I've been with the horse for just more than a year now, and the one thing after I took this job that I changed in my own horse management is that not letting my horse go nose to nose with other horses when I'm out in public, because it's so easy. You go to the lesson barn, you're chatting with your friends, the horses start rubbing noses and squealing, and everyone thinks it's, you know, kind of funny and cute, um, and I no longer do that. I have one of my horses is especially a social butterfly. He's very sad because he doesn't get to meet everyone nose to nose, but I'm just not willing to take the risk. Yeah, After hearing about all this scary them, stuff. <laughs> yeah, you're taking them to an environment that's stressful, uh, believe it or not. It's off their farm. It's in a trailer ride, start, stop. All that stuff stresses out the horse. Even though he's a very sociable horse, he could be harboring that disease, or he could come against a horse who also hauled in who doesn't handle hauling very well. 
start to stress, this is going to bring these viruses out a little bit more prevalent is when you stress the animals. So they can have them and then bring them out uh, in a stressful situation, which is why we always see them at the showgrounds or at these events, because horses are under stress. Yeah. You hardly ever hear about a herpes outbreak in a day-to-day -day farm that nobody ever leaves the farm. Yeah, or even, at, or even at trail rides. Yeah. Yeah, so you have to think about the stressful situation of what your horse is going. Even though you see yours as a social butterfly, they are still stressed in a, in a low-level way. Um, there is another uh, febrile case here in Florida um, that you'll probably hear about. And uh, that one did test positive, but only has a fever and is not showing neurologic signs. Um, but of course, it's part of the quarantine area, and they're just keeping track of the animals. So we on the horse.com are you know, track things that are going on nationwide. So if people are looking for a really solid information, look for it there. Um, we, we are very, very careful about checking in with the state vets, getting accurate information. There were some questionable numbers on the Utah cases this morning. Um, we went in, we verified it. It's all, all good information. So check the horse.com. We'll have that information on there. Uh, we're always looking and talking to people to make sure that we have information out to the horse owners. And I have yeah, the University of Florida and the state, uh, the state vets last night had a discussion with the uh, area horse owners in Marion County. There was a nice meeting they had last night at the uh, extension office, and it was very helpful for those understanding you know, why there's this quarantine and why they're tracking the other horses and why they're quarantining the other farms. So mm -hmm. your yeah, local no. people will probably have those. Yeah, and the, the officials do a great job of, of managing this stuff. It's a hard job. <laughs> you guys have a yeah. hard job. Uh, so we have some articles on thehorse.com. Uh, there's one. It's five things you need to know about EHV1. It's by our news editor, Erica Larson. Uh, look for that. Um, if you get on and just search five things EHV1 uh, in our top search bar. We also have a fact sheet if you want to print it out. Uh, keep it in your barn, um, do that. You go to free reports, and you can just search for EHV1 there, equine herpes virus. Um, and then keep checking back for news, our Facebook page. Uh, we're going to keep keep everyone up to date on all of this. So thank you, Dr. Jones, for coming and talking about it. Thanks for helping me out on Friday when I was looking for information. Well, there you go. To listen to more of the Horse.com's tips, just go to horsetipdaily.com and go to the Experts drop-down menu on the left. If you love listening to the Horses in the Morning gang putting in their two cents on everything horse, you can tune in every weekday morning at horsesinthemorning.com. Don't forget to support our sponsors here on Horse Tip Daily because they make these podcasts possible. Today's podcast has been brought to you through the generous support of equestriancollections.com. Please stop by the Horse Tip Daily Facebook page and let us know what you think of the tips you hear on the show. It's also a great place to tell us about topics you'd like to hear us cover on the show. You can subscribe to all the great shows on the Horse Radio Network through iTunes or Zune and get your horse podcasts automatically downloaded to your iPod, Zune, or MP3 player. You can also listen to the shows right on Facebook. The player's right there every day. I'll be back again tomorrow with another new expert and a different horse tip. Until then, go ride your horse! The Horse Radio Network and the Horse Radio Network hosts are not responsible for statements of guests or their opinions. Use your own judgment when listening to the tips provided by the experts on Horse Tip Daily. Music